This video is sponsored by The Daily Upside, the completely free business newsletter. Check out the link in the description for more information. Global markets have attempted a recovery after seven weeks of just sliding. But if you turn on the news, the tone is far from positive. Bear market territory. Bear market. Bear market. Bear market. If you go down in the woods today. If you go down to the woods today, stock market declines you will find. As the grisly realization sets in that the stock market bears are having a picnic with our portfolios. Not only bear market territory, but some of them are in crash territory. And the returns that were on offer in 2020 are at polar opposite to what is on offer today. Bull markets do not last forever. But is mainstream media just looking to pander to retail investors who have seen all their gains blew up in their face? Or is investing in the markets right now all poo, no winnie? For every bear that ever there was will gather there for certain because I went through countless academic papers and a whole host of articles, blogs and podcasts looking for the answers to certain questions. You ain't got the answers! Because if analysts and mainstream media are right and we do slip into a bear market, the research materials that I've studied would suggest that things could get pretty ugly from here. So is this gonna happen? How messy will it all get? And most importantly, when will it all end? Oh my days, please let it end. Let's go. Today's the day the teddy bears have their I'm sure you've seen graphs like this before. My personal favorite is this one that details the internal struggles of your average investor. But be it emojis or emotions, all of these graphs are depicting one thing, the market cycle. So the reason I wasted a load of ink printing these off can be described best of all by this one. Why I like this chart for today's video is it adds two other elements to the stock market cycle. We have the bull, and then we have the bear. Bear markets are characterized typically by falling share prices, and those who are said to be bearish are said to be pessimistic about the future of the stock market. The origins of the term bear are uncertain, something to do with the way they fight and the bear skin trade in the wild west of America. But using Google Engram, we can see that the term bear market first started popping up around 300 years ago. But despite this, there is no formal definition of what a bear market is. It's a Pagan and Susan of 2003 was the first example or label that I could find. Recent usage in financial press, however, seems to have refined this to insist on the rise, fall of the markets being greater or less than 20 to 25%. And then this 20% rule seems to just pop up everywhere. Investopedia uses it, Fortune Magazine, The Motley Fool. I even found it in this paper titled Analysis of Asymmetric and Persistence in the Stock Market Returns Volatility in the Nairobi Securities Exchange Market Phases. Rolls off the tongue that, done it. But why is all this important? Well, it's this 20% or more the S&P 500's approach on it that has got everyone in a right state. No! Data suggests if we cross that 20% line, if we tip into the bear market, the chances of a much bigger sell-off increase dramatically. On screen is a list of all the recognized bear markets in the S&P 500 index since 1929. The main thing I want to look at from here is the average decline of a bear market is around 35 to 36% and only in around one third of all bear markets did the decline not break into the 30% range. So you could say if the S&P 500 drops below this negative 20% mark, there is a two thirds chance that that could then sell off to minus 30%. And that's why every analyst in the world is currently saying, oh, I think we have another 13% to drop. These overpaid commentators are just quoting the average. I mean, great analysis, guys. But if there's one thing we know on this channel, it's that averages mean diddly squat. For example, the average American eats nearly 13 pounds of ice cream per year. But does Matt from freezing cold Minnesota really eat 190 chalk ices every year? Yes, I worked out how many chalk ices are in 13 pounds. Hundreds and hundreds of chalk ices. Or is it that his compatriots from more comfortable climates are consuming all the chocolate covered cow's milk? Averages are misleading and rarely is there any one example of actually hitting the average smack bang on. Looking at this table again, only two examples actually had bear markets that hit the 35 to 36% average. But one thing is clear. If the market touches the dreaded 20% mark, there is likely to be more downward pressure and more selling. This is a paper by Cesar Alvarez that discusses the likelihood of a sell-off in a market. He explains across his data, he found that any sell-off that is 10% or more has a 49% chance of evolving into a bear market. So in 50% of cases, these 10% declines turned into bear markets. And considering the fact that we're sat at about minus 17.9% at the time of recording this, if I had to make a bet, I would say that we could slip into bear market territory any day now, maybe even by the time I posted this video. Nope, markets are up. But let's face it, we're all nursing losses. I'm sat here talking about the S&P 500 dropping 20%. I know some of you are nursing 80% losses on some of the growth stock positions. So what's another 10% amongst friends? Just throw it on the pile. 
I think a better question to ask, and one that's got far more interesting answers, is how long is this all gonna last? It's like doing a plank in the gym. I can take the pain as long as I know how long is left on the clock. No am I trying to kid? I don't do planks. Anyway, back to the data. The average bear market lasts 298 days, or 9.6 months, according to data compiled by Ned Davis Research. But again, averages, ice creams, you know. We can see from the data that the shortest bear was the one we experienced around COVID which lasted all of 33 days. And the longest are those in the 70s and 80s, when disastrous monetary policy and runaway inflation led to a rather crap decade for investors. Sounds ominously familiar, doesn't it? But I would challenge this data because they seem to split the dot-com bubble into two sections. Unsatisfied with the use of these averages, I hit the papers again, in search of any other measures I could find. I found this. All of the papers I'm referencing, by the way, are linked in the description for you. Some of them are behind paywalls because I had to pay for them, but I've tried where I can to find PDF versions for free and I'll try and link those for you. Speaking of free sources of information, actually, Today's video is sponsored by The Daily Upside, the completely free business newsletter that is emailed to your email inbox every day. I honestly love the newsletter and its ability to condense all the major finance stories into a quick five minute read. The tone's great with bits of humor sprinkled in and they cover a broad range of topics, regularly covering both the UK and US based news, as well as investing, crypto and traditional finance. For example, this piece covering the recent tax on profits on energy companies in the UK. Or this one that discusses a load of money being raised within the crypto space. I honestly approached them and asked them if they wanted to sponsor the channel because I read the newsletter every day. So check out the link in the description. As I said, it's completely free to sign up. You just register using that link. And if you don't like it, you could always unsubscribe if you want to. Okay, back to the video. This paper says that the expected duration of bear markets is only 15% of the bull market's duration. If that's the case, how lovely would that be? All we need to do is look at the previous bull run and you know, work out 15% and then we've got our timeline. This bull market is the longest period of uninterrupted gains in American history. She the longest bull run in history, which by this measure will means we'll then have the longest bear market in history. It's not ideal, is it? But hold on a minute. We experienced a bear market in March 2020 off the back of one of the longest bull runs ever. And that thing only lasted 33 days. So what gives? Many will rightfully say at this point that the Fed stepped in and started dishing out dollars like monopoly money. And that in reality, the bear market was artificially cut short by all the financial stimulus. Let's be honest with ourselves. This graph and the gains we made make absolutely no sense. So what we're probably finding now is the landing place of the almighty bucket that central banks all over the world kick down the road. So let's just ignore that blip and say that the bull run we've seen has lasted about 12 years. So by this metric of 15%, we're staring down the barrel end of a 657 day bear market. But I've got a problem with this 15% rule. Using this table of data, I went through each market and compared the bull to the bear and only found in examples where the bull markets were over 100 days, did this 15% rule come anywhere close. In reality, most of the time, it was way off. So the brightest people in the academic world don't appear to have a scooby about how long bear markets last for, which probably comes as no surprise to anyone. We just know statistically, once we cross that minus 20% threshold, there is a high chance of a wider sell-off. At this point, I bet you're thinking, wow, this is depressing. But one thing I try and be on this channel is positive, when the rest of the investing world tends to be really negative. So while I was dissecting all this data on bear markets, I put together a few key takeaways that I think are a bit more positive that mainstream media often miss. The media would have you thinking that bear markets are rare because there's only been 26 in the S&P 500's history. In reality, 26 times is a lot. That's one on average every 3.5 years. I think the unprecedented bull run from say 2009 to now has just left people feeling all kinds of spoiled and not used to seeing dips in the markets. When in reality, the averages, which mean nothing, tell us that Drops in the market are a feature, not a bug. For example, coming back to this study, it shows there have been 154 declines in the S&P 500 price of 5% since 1929. 92% of years have had a 5% drop, and there's been 90 10% sell-offs since 1929. Let's say you've got an investing timeline of 30 years. Well, you should expect reasonably to see 8.5 dips in the S&P 500 over that time that are 20% or over. It doesn't matter how uncomfortable it is, that's the bed you're lying in, Goldilocks. Get used to it. Now, while that makes declines in prices sound scarily common, which they are, in the last 92 years, the market has been bearish for about 20.6 of those years. Another way of saying that is the market has been bullish 78% of the time. And what we find is the bull markets run a lot higher than the bear markets run low. This graph is a great depiction of this. Stocks lose 36% on average in bear markets, but gain 114% on average during a bull market. 
the ups are better than the downs, which might lead some of you to go, okay, well, I'll just sit this one out, wait for the bear market to end. But data would suggest that that is misguided. Half of the best days to invest in the market in the last 20 years occurred during the bear market. Let that sink in. Half of all the best days to invest in the market happen when everything's going to the wall, darkest before the dawn and all that. As well as that, 34% of the other best days happen in the first two months of the bull run, when people aren't even sure if the market is in a bull run or not. More just sitting there going, nah, this is a false alarm, right here on the graph. But what happens if there's a problem? There's always a problem. What happens if the market just doesn't recover? The current situation really has been led by huge declines in certain sectors. Now you could argue that we've seen the decline in the markets. When some companies are down 80% and the Nasdaq is already in bear territory, near minus 30, that that is the decline. And the only way to go is up from here. And in the last few days, markets have rallied a touch. Or you could also point to Japan's market and say in 1989, that was overvalued and when it crashed, it never recovered. So is it possible that the US market could do the exact same thing? What with its massive debt pile and all of the money printing that went on, could it never recover? In my opinion, which means honestly nothing, I just like the sound of my own voice. The Nikkei, which is Japan's version of the S&P 500, had a load of factors working against it that America doesn't. First of all, at the time it crashed, it was wildly overpriced versus the rest of the world. About four times more expensive than anywhere else in the world, if you look at a measure called the trailing 12-month PE. America was expensive in December 2021, sure, but nothing compared to what Japan was in the past. America was a 27 versus the global average of 20, whereas back in the day, Japan was a 60 versus the global average of 15 at the time. The S&P now sits at around 19, which is above historical averages, yes. And while that implies that the market is still expensive, it might not be in as bad a shape as people think. There are other factors with Japan that I won't go into in too much detail, but headlines could include oldest average population in the world, zombie banks and the support of companies that should have died off, link to an article below for you if you wanna know what the hell a zombie company is, failure to act quick enough, and a lack of innovation. Sounds weird, doesn't it, to say lack of innovation and Japan in the same sentence? I mean, this is the place, after all, that delivered us the eyedrop funnel and the silent karaoke. But go take a look at the list of the biggest companies in Japan and find me one that wasn't created in the 1900s. America seems to constantly roll out massive businesses that just change everyone's lives. Will American markets ever recover? I don't know. In the same way, I can't control a shift of power away from America to China in like some change of world order kind of vibes. But that doesn't mean I'm gonna sit out on the sidelines and not invest in American businesses out of fear that their dominance as a global superpower will fade over time. It's why I buy a global index. I've said it before on this channel, America looked expensive and markets like the emerging markets in the UK look cheap in comparison. So I spread my investing chips across the whole globe because I'm betting on the future of the world. Because as investors, all we're simply doing is saying, I think that this company or this market or this whole planet's future is gonna be better down the road than it is today. And as human beings, that's kind of what we need to do. If we don't think that the future is gonna be better than today, what's the point? I mean, we gotta be excited about the future. We gotta do things that make us want to live. You know, it cannot always be about problems every day. I mean, do you wanna wake up every morning and everything's just a problem? Well, what, in what inspires you and what makes you excited about the future? There's gotta be some things like that. So this is why I made this video today, because every time I turn on CNBC, there's some pleb talking about the bear market, and if we hit the minus 20% mark, how we're all doomed. And I think, you know, that is the case that if we hit minus 20%, there could be a wider sell-off, but that also glosses over some of the positives that have come out of bear markets in recent history. If you invest for 30 years on average, you're probably gonna see nine bear markets in your time, with a whole host of five and 10% declines along the way. Ask yourself this, are you gonna spend a quarter of your investing life right here on the emotional squiggle line. Because to me, that sounds unbearable. Save the worst, pun till last, Damien. Finish on a high, mate, well done.